Dancing on does not slow me down. It's just what I have in me. I, I do have Down syndrome, but that's not going to stop me one bit. See, I live on my own. I clean the house. I do exercise. I walk my dog. She's, a, she's an outside dog. And I got three other brothers. They don't treat me special. My name is Mark Joseph Hubler. I'm from Indiana. I, I who's a fan. See? We're more like the different. Hello, welcome to chapter eight. In this chapter, we're gonna be discussing students with intellectual disabilities. So, let's get to it. I want you guys to be aware that there was a change of terms back in 2007, where the American Association on Mental Retardation completely went ahead and revamped the name of their organization to the American Association on Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. They wanted to drop the term mental retardation. Why? Because it's used far too much in our society as a negative connotation, as an insult. And hopefully if from the outset of this module, you saw that powerful commercial, do not use that term. It shouldn't be used anywhere on campus, shouldn't be used anywhere in society. It is extremely offensive. So remember that campaign on March 5th to spread the word, to end the word. Mental retardation has also been associated with many other terms like imbecile, moron, retardate. Just stay away from using those terms because they reflect poorly on you as a professional. They changed this name in hope that it would now with intellectual disability or developmental delay, developmental disabilities doesn't carry that much of a negative connotation. So just be careful how you use these terms. However, Changing a name doesn't always change the stereotypes that are associated with students with intellectual disabilities. These students present a number of challenges and they can be very, very, um, some of my best students had intellectual disabilities, extremely well behaved, very easy to teach. However, they're going to have a more difficult time than a typical learner. Unlike the disabilities we've discussed to date, this is the first one where we're actually looking at there is a substantial uh, disability when it comes to cognitive functioning. These students face bias and prejudice due to the labels they have. When I worked at Akron Public Schools, it was very, very tough. I had to keep all of my files pretty much guarded because how did they abbreviate mental retardation? Next to the student's name, instead of learning disabled, it said mental retard. That's ridiculous. It's outdated, it shouldn't be used. I had to go ahead and black out all of my files just in case, you know, what if a student came across that? That's extremely, extremely embarrassing for a student. So just be aware, the new term is intellectual disabilities. And these students are people first. They're not, you know, I, I, you don't teach intellectually disabled children, you teach children that face challenges. They have hopes and dreams just like all of us. However, we as a society tend to not let them take the same risks you and I were able to growing up. These students have a very, um, I would say a very guarded life and they need the opportunities to go out and try, take risks, calculate risks. Now let's not get a little bit too crazy here but they're also going to face a mountain of obstacles. One of my uh, favorite stories working with individuals with disabilities, uh, I grew up in the Cleveland area, but when I moved to North Hill in Akron, I got a chance to start going to a new grocery store. There, there was a worker who clearly you could tell had disabilities. What job do you think he had? Of course, they just had him collecting carts and bagging groceries. However, I go into the grocery store after two years and he's not there. I thought, uh oh, what happened? He probably got fired. What's up? Turns out the next week I found he was working at Target running the cash register. And I went ahead and invaded his privacy and said, hey man, what's up? What happened? He said when he was at the grocery store, they refused to allow him to be a cashier. He ended up sparking a relationship with the manager over at Target. And Target was more than willing to allow him to be trained and learn to uh, serve the public. He does a fantastic job. So there still are a lot of obstacles even in this day and age. 
the, some of these students are going to require some considerable support. And just like any of the disabilities we've discussed already, there's a wide range, a wide bell curve. So there can be mild or intense students with intellectual disabilities. So let's look at the American Association of Intellectual and Developmental Disabilities. They look at this as a disability that's characterized by significant limitations. It's not just an IQ score. We're looking at intellectual functioning as well as adaptive behavior, how, is exp how it's expressed conceptually, socially, and practical adaptive skills. When we talk about adaptive skills, those are things like self-care, um, independent living skills, just to name a few. And this condition has to occur before the individual is 18 years or older. IDEA still uses the term mental retardation. I believe in the next re reauthorization of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, this will be changed. They will probably use the term intellectual disabilities instead. They see this disability as occurring during, during or before the school year. A significant sub-average intellectual functioning that exists also with adaptive behavior deficits. Well, what are those adaptive behavior deficits? When we look at the defining characteristics for these students, we're looking at issues with cognition or uh, we would call it intellectual functioning, the ability to problem solve, things like that. Adaptive behavior, and they need supports if they're going to maintain a level of independence. And there's all different levels of support I will talk to you about in one moment. This is going to be important for you to know because issues related to adaptive behavior and supports are going to appear on your, on your exam for this module. Cognitive impairments are going to affect the individual's ability to communicate, sustain attention, could be short and long-term memory issues. Also, the ability to generalize. Remember, generalization is the ability to take information from one setting and apply it in another. And they also may have issues related to motivation. But once again, I have to tell you, these characteristics are very general. Remember, it's all about getting to know students individually, not as a group. So, when we look at adaptive behavior for our students, this is vital for functioning in the community. Are they able to travel on their own? Are they able to uh, get dressed and prepare themselves for the day? Are they able to purchase uh, items in the community, go through a grocery store? There are a lot of different skills required just to go shopping nowadays. I'll tell you one thing I absolutely can't stand, self-checkout give me a half a break. Not only do I now have to go to the store and pick out the items I want, I've got to check these items out myself, forget it. However, teaching students if they need to just purchase one item, how do they go about scanning um, a code and go about paying for things using these new and updated you know, technology in the store can be daunting. Some of the supports we're going to talk about one are natural supports. These are supports that are found in any environment. So for instance, if a student just needed a little bit of extra time or extra assistance on a job, this might be able to be provided by a coworker or maybe a manager. There are unpaid supports, generic supports, and specialized. And let's see what those look like. All right, here are the major components set forth by AAIDD. As you can tell, the first column has intellectual functioning. And this functioning looks begins from the, I would call it the most mild to the most significant. And you can see here, even in the first category, significantly below average determined by clinical judgment or IQ tests. Remember, when we conduct assessments on our students, these are done thoroughly. There's a multiple, multiple measures of an individual's intelligence and functioning. And you can see it goes from mild, moderate, severe, to profound. The second column 
is really important. This is the adaptive behavior I was just talking about. When it comes to conceptual adaptive behavior, this is language, concepts related to money, self-direction, are they able to read and write? These are critical skills for employment, critical skills to get around in the community. The second component of adaptive behavior is socialization. Do they have interpersonal skills? Are they able to express their desires, their wants, their needs? How are they motivated? Do they have a self-esteem? Are they able to obey laws and follow rules? And most importantly, our students are very susceptible to being victims. So it's important to teach them self-advocacy skills, teach them to be able to know what's right and what's wrong. And the last one is practical. Can these individuals help themselves? Do they have life skills? Life skills meaning, are they able to do laundry? Are they able to cook for themselves? Are they able to be safe in the community? Do they know how to uh, use public transportation? And of course, occupational skills, which is critical. We want our students to be able to have jobs, have a full life. Think about how, how much socialization and how much experience you've gotten so far from any full-time or part-time job. It's a, it goes far beyond, far beyond the monetary issue, but it also looks at another, another avenue to make friends, another avenue to um, express yourself as an individual. And of course, the third column are the systems of support I mentioned. These levels of support appear in four different levels. The first one is intermittent. This is provided as needed during, I would call them lifetime transitions. They might need a, a little bit of extra support when they're moving from on a, one apartment to another. They might need some additional support if they're changing jobs or if they're seeking employment. And once they get established, they'll be on their own. They're also what's called limited. These are time limited supports for employment training. Around uh, the Akron area, I know th uh, the Bureau of Vocational Rehabilitation provides anywhere from 40 to 80 hours for individuals that are starting a new job. If they need more than that, it goes into more extensive supports. These students are gonna need regular involvement in at least some environment. It's not gonna be all the time, but it's gonna be much more, it's not gonna be limited. They're gonna need some supports of paying bills, um, of cooking, living independently. And the last level is pervasive. These individuals are gonna need support daily. And the, these are going to be long-term uh, as far as the individual uh, individual's functioning is concerned. Pervasive, stu pervasive students, shouldn't say pervasive students, students with pervasive needs are going to need extended supports and a lot of wraparound services. My name is Maura Rossi. I am 20 years old. I go to the University of North Florida. I love college. It's the best thing. I'm studying right now career planning and journalism. I'm also taking voice lessons. I want to sing on American Idol and um, kind of win Simon Cowell over. See, you're more alike than different. My goal is to be successful and be an international sensation. AAIDD says that an intellectual disability is characterized by significant limitations both in intellectual functioning and in adaptive behavior, which covers many everyday social and practical skills. The disability originates before the age of 18. To understand the definition, let's take a few minutes to break it down. First, significant limitations in intellectual functioning. That simply means intelligence or general mental capacity for things like problem solving, the ability to reason and understand. One criterion to measure intellectual functioning is an IQ test. This is the most commonly accepted way to measure intellectual functioning. 
Generally, an IQ test score of around 70 to 75 indicates a limitation in this area. Next is significant limitations in adaptive behavior. Adaptive behavior includes conceptual, social, and practical skills that have been learned in order to function in everyday life situations. Examples of conceptual skills include reading and writing, money concepts, and the ability to understand written or spoken language. Social skills are things like following rules and obeying laws, how you interact with other people, and your own sense of self-esteem. Practical skills include day-to-day -day activities such as routines, housekeeping, and safety. To measure adaptive behavior, professionals look at what a person can do in comparison to others in the same age group. The last part of the definition is originates before the age of 18. This simply means that for someone to have an intellectual disability, whatever happened to change the typical course of development had to happen before the age of 18. My name is Christopher Scott, and I'm from Texas. I'm 31 years old, and uh, I have Down syndrome. Well, I like my job. I'm a teacher assistant, and I work with kids. That's where I get some of my energy from. I like lots of movies. See, I like to go dancing, get my groove on. See, we are more alike than different. All right, how prevalent are individuals with intellectual disabilities? Well, they've got this calculated. It's slightly less than 1% of all children are identified and receive services under this category. Why is this percent lower than the estimated 3% that the population may have? A lot of districts prefer to use other categories. Some parents will definitely shy away from having their child labeled as having an intellectual disability, and they may call it a learning disability. They might call it uh, something else under another umbrella of terms. And not all students with cognitive disabilities are identified with this as their primary disability. Once again, it might be comorbid with another disability. There is a lot of concern about overrepresentation in this category, especially with minority groups. And a lot of times we were gonna, they'll shy away from using this term and use another. But like I said in previous chapters, the important thing is these individuals get the supports and the educational interventions they need. Labels really don't dictate the services children are gonna get. So what do we know that causes intellectual disabilities within our population? Once again, most of the causes remain under unidentified. And AAIDD also recognizes that the time of onset is important. Did these uh, disabilities appear prenatally? Were they genetic or did they happen afterwards? So what are some of the things we need our children to stay away from? Oh my gosh, big surprise. Keep your kids away from toxins, just in case you didn't know. But some of the ones listed in your text, FAS, fetal alcohol syndrome, not good to chug beers while you're pregnant or wine or vodka, stay away from it. Lead poisoning, I really don't know how prevalent that is, but it's, it's still there. Mercury, pesticides, industrial pollution. We, we have a, a problem in our society with pollution big time. And just to, I guess, put a, a picture to it, I know you guys are a lot younger than I am, but last time the Olympics were in the United States, the Summer Olympics were in Atlanta, they asked the people in the city to use public transportation and keep as many cars off the road as they could for all the, um, all the visitors that would be coming there. They had a significant drop in emergency room visits for students that were suffering from asthma, dropped drastically over half of the students, they, of the kids they normally would serve in the hospitals, didn't have to go in the, during those months the Olympics were, be, were, were in town. How amazing is that? 
a simple change in our environment can make our kids healthier. Other issues related to intellectual disabilities, students that are born low birth weight, issues of child abuse and neglect, and they also face discrimination and bias out in the community. What are some of the genetic causes? And I know Zippy's appearing on a couple of these slides. Remember, if you see that, see the rue, it's an exam clue. Some of the common genetic causes, I'm sure you've all heard of Down syndrome, and that's that extra chromosome that attached to the 21st pair. There's PKU and Fragile X syndrome. Definitely go to your text and read about each one of these conditions. It'll be good for you to prepare for the exam, and it'll be good for you when you're serving these students within your general education classroom. So how do we prevent these disabilities? Intellectual disabilities can be prevented through education. Encouraging testing for expectant mothers to help analyze risk, risk factors and screening of infants. I will, I will say this, please know, this is not related to the class, but this is just something good for you to know in the future. All, all analyzing factors when it comes to um, pregnancy tests, when it comes to um, any tests that expected mothers might go through, ultrasound, any type of those screenings, know the risk factors when going to the hospital. All of them have some associated risk. You don't want to do too many tests that are unnecessary. We're also looking at better prenatal care, PKU screening, vaccinations, and a nurturing home and school environment can help prevent and reduce the occurrence of individuals with intellectual disabilities. When it comes to vaccinations, another video you might enjoy watching is free, it's online. If you search frontline, I want you to see the vaccine war. Very, very interesting for those of you that are gonna be teaching, having children. It's good for you to stay informed because a lot of the information we get off of Wikipedia, off of you know the news, super, super short news clips that you know are more tasty than they are healthy for you, check it out. It is a very well documented um, special on what's going on with children and vaccinations across our country. When it comes to assessment for students with intellectual disabilities, they're identified through their adaptive behavioral skills. After a, the students have an IQ or uh, adaptive behavior need identified, it is critically important that teachers start to intervene and find out what works. IQ scores do not give us any type of information about how a student learns, about the best way to approach interventions with the student. Just the label of intellectual disability will give you no direction on how to better serve students. It's going to be observing, figuring out what types of educational techniques work best. So after the assessment and need has been confirmed, it's up to us to come up with interventions and figure out what is the correct level of service intensity that would be appropriate for our students. Remember, it's a free and appropriate public education. What is the most appropriate approach to teach the individual? We also want to stay away from IQ tests because we've already dis discussed the cultural bias that comes to that. And once again, the results really don't lead to any type of teaching interventions. But adaptive behavior remains the most important category. And with this, you may see on some assessments a mental age. It is not appropriate to use that, along with, you might even see uh, grade level, grade age. Don't use those. Why? Because it leads to misinterpretations and inappropriate comparisons. It's not appropriate to go, oh, you know, your 18-year-old son is technically, according to this, he's five years, six months. It just doesn't sound good to parents. Talk about what they can do, not what they can't do. We want to be positive in our approaches when working with parents and working with other professionals and keeping the student first, not their disability. I am Christy Harkle and I am 29 years old and I have Down syndrome. Yes, I just joined the gym. 
I love to exercise. Exercise is my thing. I, I can lift 140 pounds. I just love it. I just love being there. It's really fun. I like to get healthy and strong and skinny. See, we're more alike than different. My mom keeps saying, Christy, you need to listen right. So how do we do early identification? We know many of our students already come to school with this label. If students have more severe intellectual disabilities, they're already going to be identified probably by a physician, by, uh, by the medical profession. Those children will receive, if you remember from chapter one, an individualized family services plan to help families better provide services to their child. In the pre-referral stage, teachers need to collect data that reflects what types of classroom performance the student can do, evidence-based instruction, like what does work? Does this, is the student a visual learner? Do they learn by modeling? Do they learn best by using functional skills? And we wanna monitor these approaches to figure out how the student learns best. It's a lot like the functional behavior assessment I showed you from the previous chapter. It's going through and hypothesizing, finding out what works best. And finally, these students participate in what's called alternate assessments. This process changes every single year. Alternate assessments are there because these students aren't participating in the same standards-based curriculum students in the general education are following. They're following more adaptive functional skills and that's what we want to test them on. And these alternative assessments also keep special educators on their toes, making sure their students are making progress towards independence, towards occupational skills, and towards adult life. Another benefit of early intervention is the fact that we can actually reduce the severity of cognitive disabilities or maybe even prevent them altogether. There's been research studies that show the positive results from early preschool experiences, showing higher IQ scores, higher uh, rates of high school graduation, higher income levels, and higher incidences of home, home ownership, which is great. Inclusive education is much more prevalent at the preschool level than we'll see in K-12 settings. But here's the massive benefits from this. Students with intellectual disabilities engaging in preschool play with their typically developing peers will have higher rates of social skills than those that did not attend preschool. Look at children on the playground when they're interacting with each other, when they're learning from each other. They learn language skills. They learn physical, fine motor skills. The more interaction they have with others, the better they're gonna do and typically developing children gain the appreciation and respect for individual differences and for students with disabilities in general. Kids are much more welcoming than adults in many cases. Students will jump right in. If you wanna see a better video regarding this, check out Educating Peter. It goes along with Graduating Peter that we're gonna be watching in this class near the end of the semester. It was done by HBO Films. Educating Peter shows what it's like to, to have an inclusive elementary school classroom for a student with Down syndrome. Check it out. When teaching students with intellectual disability, we're going to look at the access to the general education curriculum that they have. Unfortunately, most students with intellectual disabilities don't access the general ed curriculum. Some people may look at this as a bad thing, but remember, we need to have a continuum of services for our students. And if they're not gonna be getting the optimal education they need in let's say an algebra class or um, an economics class, it's far better that they participate and learn the functional skills they're gonna need after they graduate. There's much room for improvement when it comes to um, inclusion for these students. However, I think you saw in a previous video, one of my former students, Todd Isinger, I can tell you the students I had with intellectual disabilities were included in band, the swim team, Spanish. Um, they were in uh, nutrition and wellness classes. 
it's important for teachers to promote that, to get them involved in school in every aspect. It's going to increase social skills, their visibility within the school, and opportunities to make more friends. Instructional accommodations for academic content require modifications. Remember what modifications are. Modifications are adjustment to the curriculum and we're going to alter it in some way. They're going to have a, a different level of expectation. So remember, the difference between an accommodation and a modification, that's good for you to review in your text. I am Christy Hockel. I am 29 years old, and I have Down syndrome. Something special just happened to me. My boyfriend asked my dad in the hint of marriage. He's wonderful. He's cute. I love him a lot. I want to be beautiful as a bride. See, we are more alike than different. I'm going to have a big, big wedding for 300 people. For students with intellectual disabilities, self-determination is a database best practice. We know that we want to make our students as independent as possible. So with this, self-determination is, is a specific instructional approach that provides guided practice for students to become more independent. Individuals with higher level of self-determination skills tend to graduate from high school, tend to obtain and hold employment, and have better experiences as adults than those with low self-determination skills. These skills are learning how to self-advocate and make their own choices. Can they set goals? Can they problem solve? And they, can they evaluate their own performance critically? One of my favorite stories is a student, we'll call him Andy, he, wanted to, he came to me uh, when I was working in an employment program. Andy wanted to do nothing but landscaping. Davis O won a landscape. So I, you know, I was trying to figure out what was the hook for Andy and landscaping. Well, think about it. Landscaping guys are pretty cool. Usually tatted up. Some of them get to work without their shirts on. They get to work outside. They get to use cool tools. Andy was all about that. I worked for three weeks trying to get Andy a job, finally found one on a college campus. He was working with the uh, grounds crew and he started in the uh, late spring. Late spring rolls around, what's the, what's the first thing we do in Ohio? We start spreading mulch. Well, when Andy had to start spread mulch, he came back and told me exactly what the mulch smelled like and he was very explicit. D Davis O don't want to do this anymore. Job stinks. What I realized is Andy made a choice but really didn't make an informed choice. He had no idea what landscaping really was. He should have, if, it, if I did it right, I should have gone out there and at least had him try the job before I went and found him one. Had him go out and job shadow. Our students need experiences in the community to find out what they like, what they don't like, what they're interested in. It gives them a more well-rounded uh, set of experiences to make those informed choices. When it comes to technology for this population, your book talks about eBuddies. Give me a break. The email system is coming to be outdated. Our students can get hooked up with Facebook, all types of new social networking, Instagram. EBuddies was just a way for students to use computers in a less uh, technical fashion, but most students have no problem with technology. They've grown up on it. But you're going to have to provide explicit instruction on how to use computers and other communication devices because it's going to be an important part of the curriculum for students with intellectual disabilities. Beyond your text, let's look at some new technology focusing on apps. All right, let, let's look at some apps that can be used <clears throat> on the iPad or any type of uh, tablet device. This first one is a set of apps for transit uh, authorities in, like Metro and the transit system in Columbus. This could help our students better navigate the community with all the information right in the palm of their hand as they travel. 
This one is called Social Situations and it allows students to analyze um, effective communication when they're interacting with others. This could really help our students become uh, better communicators. Um, as far as when it comes to financial concerns of our students, this is what's called Expense Tracker and can be used on either device. This could help students save, um, make budgets, or plan for purchases. It's pretty interactive. Here's one on telling time. It's, there's over 700 uh, clock uh, pictures for students to analyze and get better at telling time in the community, another important skill. And remember, I'm gonna continually be researching apps and adding these to my LiveBinder site. Check it out at the top of my YouTube channel so you can check out all the app updates as I post them. What does transition look like for students with intellectual disabilities? It's pretty intense, as well it should be, because we have to get these students prepared for post-school life. What's gonna happen after they graduate? And a traditional functional curriculum should focus on everyday life skills. Things like holding a job, being able to maintain relationships and friendships, traveling independently in the community from home or to work. That's teaching them how to use the Metro bus system, teaching them how to use a taxi if they need to. I even took my students to the Cleveland Hopkins airport to teach them how do you get through an airport? How do you go about buying tickets? How do you go through security? It can be pretty intense. Some other examples your text gives you using cell phones, reading survival words, making sure they know, how about this? Next time you're out, look at all the different signs for men's and women's bathrooms. Getting them to be able to figure out and problem solve. Going into the wrong bathroom after you're 18 years old, lots of times society frowns on that big time. And just because they have, may have an intellectual disability, it may, they might not show any outward signs. And they might not get the sympathy other students that may, you know, can, where you can actually see that an individual is struggling cognitively. So try to teach them as many skills as you can in the community in which we're expecting them to participate. And employment, extremely important to independence. Right now across the state, career and technical programs are trying to better serve our students and teach them critical job skills for the market that lies ahead. Vo vocational rehabilitation programs can provide training. Some of our students end up working in uh, workshops. They can also get counseling and job placement services. Let's take a look at a transition program for students with intellectual disabilities and check out and see what it's like. Nova chose to offer Transition to Work because this program is a natural extension of what Nova has been doing since it began in 1990, helping young persons with a disability find and maintain employment. Our participants get priority of entry into Nova Employment's Disability Employment Program. Job coaches help each other explore their work possibilities and options and progressively develop work skills in an interactive training environment that is adult, safe, fun and supportive. Our programs are run in modern training rooms within Nova offices. This means young persons are learning in a job focused environment. Groups are facilitated by job coaches chosen for their ability to mentor and encourage progress. Due to our partnership with NOVA Training, participants have the opportunity to achieve a nationally recognised qualification, Certificate 1 in Work Education. We would love to show you what is being achieved and you're welcome at any time to see for yourself what is going on. It's generally best to give us a call before you come as we are often out and about on an excursion, industry visit or hands-on interactive learning activity. You can make a personal appointment with a job coach to discuss your requirements. You can either email or phone for a chat. Nova Transition gets results. The majority of participants that come to Nova Transition move into paid employment, real jobs in their local area. I have the ability to be an achiever. 
I have the ability to be productive. I have the ability to be reliable. I have the ability to work hard. If you're an employer seeking staff who can get the job done, visit novaemployment.com.au. At Nova, we focus on ability. When it comes to collaboration for this population, multidisciplinary teams can make a real difference in the lives of students with intellectual disabilities. Meaning that the more information you can gather, the more services that you can provide, the better off the student's going to be. There are therapeutic recreation specialists that can help students gain a greater presence and participation in the community. Participate, get your students out there going to um, high school football games, school dances, and there still is. We talked about the, the bias and discrimination our students face. When it came time for my students to go to homecoming, guess who else had to go to the homecoming? I did. At the time, the principal said, hey, if your students are going to be there, you should be there too. When in reality, my students were some of the best, best behaved students that were at that function. There's also what's called adapted physical education. This can provide students um, help in developing muscle strength and just general exercises. There's adapted physical education programs all over Akron. Edwin Shaw Hospital has a therapeutic golf program I took my students to. If you really want to investigate further, you could check out the yearbook in Firestone High School from 1999. You could see my students were part of the golfing program. It was a lot of fun. They also do, uh, they do bowling. And what my favorite thing about taking students with individu individuals with disabilities bowling is they have all kinds of adaptations there. I love the fact that they have bumpers now instead of gutters increases my score greatly they also have um, adaptive ramps if students can't um, bear the weight of the entire bowling ball they can just roll it down a ramp kind of cool but developing extracurricular involvement rarely happens unless educators are willing to jump in and work hard at it you're going to have to have collaboration between teachers parents and related service providers Let's take a look at what an adapted physical education program may look like when you get into the schools. Alex Yechuk, I'm a phys ed specialist at Nashwalk System Middle School in Fredericton, New Brunswick. Well, a big thing is just keeping them active no matter what. and, uh, and as long as my entire, my entire group or class knows that it, it doesn't matter what your ability is, that, that we can adapt and that, that it can be fun regardless of your, uh, of your athletic ability. You know, it's one thing to see kids sitting on the sidelines, but it's another to see these, these kids uh, having a hard time with their own confidence, their own self-esteem, and not believing that they can do something. And uh, I see it all the time with kids placing limits on themselves at such a young age. So. I think seeing that is kind of a motivator to, to get them off, their, uh, off the sidelines and into the game. My name is Lee McDougall and I'm a K-12 phys ed mentor here in District 18 or what used to be District 18 in New Brunswick. There's a boy behind us who is running. Uh, there's a boy I met as a grade one student. Who, uh, who was blind and uh, I was working with his classroom teacher at the Go. time and so uh, I met him and was absolutely amazed at what he was able to teach me and so he sort of has been my jumping off point. I've, uh, I've known him since he was six years old and, uh, and he's the one that made me aware of sort of some, some divots so to speak in, uh, in some of the knowledge for our teachers. Probably the easiest adaptations are speaking directly with the kids and, and making as few adaptations as possible, making the, the experience as, as real and as much like everybody else's as possible. Um, it's making uh, just sort of from soup to nuts in your equipment room, but it, it's all it, the best way to do it is to talk directly to the students and find out uh, what they're comfortable with and, and working with them to make the adaptations. Um, my name is Janet McVicker and I'm a, a 
a vision teacher with uh, the Atlantic Provinces Special Education Authority. I'm based out of Fredericton, but um, uh, I have students in uh, a number of districts, so I do some traveling out of Fredericton with, to uh, see my students. Um, when I work with my students, um, it's about having them understand um, the tools and adaptions, modifications that they can make to the activities that they're involved in. Um, so that they can advocate for themselves when they're when they're participating elsewhere, that they can tell someone or other their their friends or peers or other teachers um, what it is that they can do um, to uh, participate. Uh, one student that I have who is blind, when he was in elementary, uh, the kids played soccer at at recess and at noontime on the soccer field, and. Um, or actually they were setting it up on a, beep, on a, on a uh, baseball field and they played uh, uh, soccer baseball. And uh, the kids were playing and, and my student walked over to where, he was on his own and he walked over to where the game was being played. And the kids engaged him, they brought him up to the home plate and instead of rolling the ball, they put the ball in front of him so he just had to kick it. And then someone on first base, someone on the other team from first base, when he kicked the ball, the person on the other team was clapping at first base so he would know where the base was. So he ran to the base. And then when he was on first base, they turned him around to face second. The next person came up, kicked the ball, and someone on second base on the other team clapped to make him go there. But the beauty is, they weren't going to give it to him. It wasn't a gift because the ball went to close to second base. So the person picked up the ball and tagged him out. So they knew how to engage him because they knew by clapping and by putting the ball in front of him rather than rolling it to him, he was able to participate and play. So the kids, by knowing how to involve him, by, by seeing the adaptions that are made by his, their physical education teachers or others, when he's on his own, when he's out playing with his friends, they know how he can play. And so it's, it's a lot of that. Once the kids understand that, number one, the kids can play and how they can help them play, then they're, then they're all over it. Justin Marshall, Para-MB Sport and Recreation. Fredericton. Mm -hmm. When it comes to partnerships with families and communities, as an educator, you should be actively involved in your community. Get to know the needs of families. Get to know the, the culture of the population you intend to serve. When it comes to individuals with intellectual disabilities, you should be developing meaningful partnerships with the students' families, getting to know their needs, working with them on a consistent basis to help the student reach their educational and behavioral goals. You need to recognize that all significant members of a family unit are going to be affected by the child's disability and can, and can be effective members of any uh, team to help improve the child's independence. You need to understand that families are going to need support and this support is going to extend way beyond the needs of what just what goes on in your classroom. They're going to need support years after they graduate. And you need to include the entire family unit in planning meetings about the student's educational program. I'm going to show you one approach that's mentioned in our text. It's called person-centered planning. Let's take a look at what person-centered planning looks like and how it can help individuals with intellectual disabilities. Michael, why is person-centered planning important? If people are to have the lives that they want, if when we're talking about people who are at risk of losing control or have lost control of their lives, if they're to have the lives they want, then they have to have something that says, here's what's important to me, here's how I want to be supported, here's how I want to live. And that's what a person-centered plan does. It provides a description of what's important to the person, how they want to live, and describes actions so that they get the life that they want. And there are different styles of person-centered planning, aren't they? Say a bit about the different styles and, and where they are, are useful and powerful. Each different style is powerful. Each different style of planning has a different power. Uh, and if you look at the main styles that are used, you would start with PATH. PATH is a remarkably powerful way of defining a destination, saying, here's how I want to live at some point in the future. And here's how we can mobilize people 
so that we can take the steps necessary to get there. MAPS, on the other hand, uh, is really about how do I mobilize a circle that's around me. And a circle would be a group of committed people who are willing to kind of walk with me and be with me and typically are mostly not paid. And MAPS is a way to mobilize that group and keep them mobilized and keep them committed and to be able to, again, look at a, at a desirable future. Both of those planning formats assume that there's a committed group of people, that there's a committed group of people who are willing to walk with you, be with you, and part of the process is to mobilize and commit those people in their work. Essential lifestyle planning, which is a third way of doing it, assumes that there are people who are knowledgeable, who know the person, but doesn't assume that there's a committed group of people around the person. It says if we can gather the information that tells us what's important to you and how to best support you, then we can make it happen. Essential lifestyle planning was really designed to be done inside systems as well as outside. Path and maps were designed to be done on the edges of systems where you could find those committed groups of people. I think people often get confused by all the terms that have person-centred at the beginning and it'd be really good if we could just run through a few of those and get some definitions. So let's start with person-centred approaches, person-centred thinking and person-centred planning. How do you define those when people ask you? Something is, all of them have person-centred at, at the beginning and, and it truly is just a normal use of language. It means the person's at the centre of the effort. It's not the system that's at the center of the effort, it's not the program, it's not the agency, it's the person. So an approach that has people at the center uh, would be person-centered. And any approach that would be used might be a strategy, it might be a policy, it might be a practice, um, but a person-centered approach is not a plan. Person-centered thinking, on the other hand, refers to a set of tools where you've taken approaches You've taken ways of doing the work, you've taken the planning, and you've broken them down into pieces so that you have discrete, act, discrete tools that can be used to support a person. The core tool that we teach is being able to sort what's important to a person from what's important for. What's important to a person, what makes them happy, fulfilled, content, satisfied, comforted. What's important for health and safety and being a valued member of the community. And if you can do a good job of sorting that and describe the balance between them, then you've gone a long way towards being able to help the person get a life. But there's a whole set of other tools that go with that. The second most commonly used is working and not working. What is working for the person? What is not working for the person? And you do it from multiple perspectives. And it assists people in looking not only at how are we developing a, a way forward, but how is that way forward working? How do we need to adjust it? How do we need to take a look at it? There's a whole set of other tools that, that go with this that, and we teach eight in the initial training, but there's easily 25 or 30 that skilled practitioners use. So that's um, person-centered approaches and person-centered thinking. What about person-centered planning and person-centered descriptions? How do you uh, describe those to people? A person-centered description is a piece of a person-centered plan. And a great deal of the work that we're doing now, we're helping people get started by saying, let's work together or let me show you how to work so that you can describe how you want to live, what's important to you, what does best support look like, what are other people really like and admire about you. And that would be a person-centered description. It's not a plan until it has actions associated with it. Lovely. Thank you very much. Okay, now that we covered chapter eight, let's review. Let's look at three questions and see what you remember from this chapter. This student has an IQ of 42, and although she showed developmental delays in early childhood, she's able to live semi-independently in a group home setting. She's also had a steady job for several years, which she found and maintains with the help of a job coach. 
under which level of severity would she be classified? Correct. Moderate intellectual ab abilities. Since Jackie has an IQ of 42, remember we have to take into consideration IQ scores, adaptive behavior, and the amount of supports that, that are needed for independent living. Next question. Which of the following is not one of the defining characteristics for mental retardation or intellectual disabilities? Got the answer yet? Right. Difficulty with motor skills has nothing to do with this category. We'll talk about students with physical or health um, disabilities in chapter nine, but when it comes to students with intellectual disabilities, motor functioning is not a characteristic. All right, let's look at this last one. Tara has a moderate intellectual disability. Her educational goals contain little access to the general education curriculum. Her curriculum focuses more on functional skills. Tara's progress is going to be assessed using what technique? Did you remember? Right, alternate assessments. All right, if you have any questions regarding information in this chapter, you know to always contact myself or Sarah Noble. And until next time, have a good one.